Hello everyone, today we're going to be exploring Squadron Strike's beam weapons. Now beam weapons are the simplest weapon type in Squadron Strike. They basically represent any sort of weapon that can reach its target at extremely high velocity. You're talking anything that can travel 25,000 kilometers in under 6 minutes is basically considered a beam weapon. So that can include things like very, very high speed railguns and stuff like that. But uh, in our particular case, they're going to be actual beams. So in this particular situation, we've uh, set up a really, really, really basic little uh, deal here. We have uh, the Cutter Mark II, and we have the Cutter Mark I sitting over here. Basically, the Cutter Mark I is going to kind of choo-choo this way, and we're going to take a bunch of shots at it as it goes by. So um, if you take a look at the normal course of play in a game like this, we normally would do all our plotting and pivoting and things like that. Then we do all of our movement, and then we get down to the combat. So the combat phase is broken down a couple different ways. The first thing we have to do is decide what we're going to do for action points for defenses. We can do things like spend action points on reinforcing shields. We can use them to um, go ahead and fire certain weapons and certain mounts, charge weapons, depending on what universe you're playing. We have a section where we're going to use ECCM, which is basically electronic counter countermeasures. We can do uh, some electronic intelligence successes. We then go ahead and plot our fire, and there's three different phases of fire. We have defensive fire, when you're going to be firing your Aegis or interceptor weapons. Basically, if you have a missile that's about to hit you from an earlier turn, you can use defensive fire to engage that weapon at zero distance. Um, we also have our standard fire phase. This is when you can fire torpedoes and missiles. We'll deal with missiles and torpedoes another day. And then of course this is when you're going to reserve all reserve fire. What's reserve fire? Basically I can say I'm going to hold on to these two beam cannons and not fire them until I can see what's going to happen for my other weapons. So a lot of times what you'll do is you'll hold your beams back until you've had a chance to watch your missiles and torpedoes do the deed. Because a lot of uh, very, very clever players will rotate themselves into torpedoes and missiles, trying to make it either harder to hit or trying to make it um, so that it hits an arc and then rotates back out of the way and can't do any damage. The other thing we're going to be taking a look at today is how damage control works. Damage control is actually pretty straightforward. If you take a look at our little SSD here, you'll notice we have a couple boxes of damage control. So if you take a look at these little dots, during the plotting phase, we can choose to put crew in different parts of the ship for damage control purposes. So for example, um, I know the fact that since we're facing the way we're facing, maybe I want to put one damage control box here, maybe I want to put another damage control box in the back of the ship like this. Now at the end of the turn, if I've taken damage, I have the ability to do damage control, which is actually pretty handy, as long as the crew is in the proper spot for it. So um, it's just kind of neat how that works. If a location is hit that has damage control in it, you have to roll the quality of the crew or better to not have casualties of the damage control. And in the case of damage control, in the event that your damage control station gets damaged, you have to add two to your roll whenever you're going to go ahead and calculate how successful you are at damage control. We'll deal with that a little later on in the turn. So anyway, let's say we've done all our movement. We've moved to our end of turn marker. We're actually our end of turn marker is actually on us. We're not moving at the moment. He's kind of going like, oh, actually, he's going a lot slower than that. He's doing a speed uh, one, two, yeah, that's his speed right now. He's just kind of choo-chooing like this. So how do we take a shot? So as usual, we're going to go ahead and calculate our bearing. Everybody's moved, by the way. Keep that in mind. We've all moved first. So let's figure out how far away he is. One, two, three, four, five, six. He's six horizontal, and he's ten vertical. Six horizontal. Since this is hard to read the numbers. Ten vertical. Puts him in the green arc at a distance of eleven. He is below us. So he's in the negative 11 green arc. We'll go ahead and quickly map that. So we know if you go down from the nose 2, it's going to put him right here, which means our weapon, this weapon's going to be an arc. This weapon is not. This weapon is not. We're saving this for another day anyway. So that means our anti-fighter beam and our standard flak weapon is in range. Now let's talk about action points for a minute. This particular ship has three action points available. Action points mean two things. They're kind of a combination of bridge commands, kind of a combination of energy allocation. Anything that's shaded requires action points to fire. So in this particular case, if uh, for some reason he was in, let's say, a perfect right here in our aft, or I should say our port arc, we could engage him with both sets of these anti-fighter beams, but it would cost us two action points to fire. Keep in mind if you have shield reinforcement, things like that, which we'll deal with on his side, um, we'd have to go ahead and work with that as well. So anyway, we're going to go ahead and fire our standard flak, which we can't because if you take a look, he's at minus 11. So he's actually too far away for any of our weapons to go ahead and engage. So what we'll do real quickly is uh, we'll go ahead and take this out. We'll go ahead and get rid of this tile real quickly. And we'll go ahead and get rid of this tile real quickly. 
and we'll go ahead and slap that right there. And now we're going to change our altitude to 1 to make it a little bit better. So he is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We'll get a little closer. And an altitude difference of 1. That puts him in the yellow arc at distance 5. Okay, that's a little bit safer. That way we're not taking shots that we can't actually make. Okay, perfect. So that means, of course, he's in our nose arc, which means we can engage him with all that good stuff that we have on our ship. All right. So now, let's say it's the beginning of the phase. So this ship has no shields to reinforce. The other ship does, and we'll deal with that once we take our shot. So we're going to go ahead and spend one action point to go ahead and fire a single anti-fighter beam. So again, because it's shaded gray. So his distance, if you remember, is a distance of five, which means we're going to have to roll a five or better to do damage to him. We also have this neat ability called sweeping, and we also have this interceptor ability, which is kind of neat as well. We'll deal with that when we go ahead and use it. So anyway, so what we do is we grab ourselves four dice, and now the red dice is going to determine whether or not we hit him. But before we do that, remember, we're trying to get a five or better, except if you go to his SSD, if you have ECCM by, the, ECM, by the way, this does modify this, you'll notice that you have these little markers right here, which indicates what number you have to add in order to take a shot on the particular ship. You can see the familiar markers of front back, you can see the left right marker, and you can see the top bottom marker as well. If we're shooting a shot that arrives the front, we have to add to uh, the side, I should say. No, if we're aiming at the front, we have to add two. If we're aiming at the sides, we have to add one. Huh? Why does that make sense? Well, if you imagine what the ship looks like. Excuse my terrible art here. If we're aiming at the front, this is how much area we have to hit. If we're aiming at the side, this is how much area we have to hit. If we're aiming at the top, we have this much area to hit. So if you think about it from that perspective, it makes a lot more sense. So where are we hitting him right now? So taking a look real quickly, it looks like when our shots actually arrive, let's go ahead and sketch us on there real quick. Actually, I'm going to take a look real quick. I think that might be in a different arc. That is in a different arc. Good thing we checked. That's actually going to be over here. It's going to be a distance of five away, which means for us, it's also going to be a distance of five away. Good, 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 good. So if you take a look, we're going to be arriving, hitting him right off the front of the nose. We're basically going to be hitting him right here. So if you take a look at what arc that's going to be hitting, it's going to be hitting in the front arc, which means we have to add two to the roll. Now it makes sense. Okay, let's scoot back over here. Oop, we don't need that. So when we're firing, we're actually shooting slightly off to the left, slightly off to the left, and slightly off to the left. Again, we're only firing a single anti-fighter beam and a single standard flak. Standard flak does not require a um, action point, and we get to take two shots. Cool. So anyway, let's go ahead and try it. So since we're aiming at its teeny tiny nose, we've used our action point. By the way, all damage is simultaneous during the standard phase. So we need a five or better, plus two. We need a seven or better. I don't think this is going to end well. We'll try anyway, though. So that was a four, so that would be a miss. So our beam just just a little bit too small there, and just choo-chooed choo right by him. Now, if he were like this, it'd be a little more obvious, but like this, like I said, it's a little, little ambiguous as far as where that shot. To me, this looks like it would hit his side, but just the way that it's kind of mapped. Uh, no, I take that back. That would be hitting his side. Ah, uh, good thing I checked. I forgot that he was tilted. Yeah, his nose is here. This is one from the left, is our right side, I should say. Run off the right side, which means we're definitely hitting in here, which means we're definitely hitting this arc, which means we're only adding one to it. Unfortunately, our roll is still a failure, so um, too bad. So, all right, so we're going to be adding one to our standard flak roll. So he's at a distance of five, which means I need a seven or better, but I get two rolls for it. Hey, we got a hit. So let's see here. So how does a hit work? So um, first off, what you'd see is this is going to be our location. We're going to take these two. This is going to be our penetration roll. We're going to take that eight. We're going to subtract the smaller value of three, which gives us five. We're going to cap that by whatever the penetration of the weapon is, which happens to be two. So this is going to be two plus it's going to be doing a damage of two. So that gives us four damage. And it's going to be hitting location number one, which happens to be the nose not the nose. Ignore that for a second. This will make more sense in a minute. So our shots are going to be coming in here. We're going to be doing four damage to his 
right side, his starboard side here. Now he has what they call deflector shields. So all damage that hits the shields has to be reduced by how many boxes are available. So our shot's basically coming in like this. So we're doing four damage, minus one becomes three damage. One, two, three of those shields are shot off, which isn't terribly good because the shields basically absorbed all that and didn't do much more damage. So let's hope our next roll with the flak actually succeeds at doing even more. Oh, look, a seven again. So our penetration is nine minus two, which is going to be seven capped by two. So it's going to be two plus two is four more damage, and it's to location six this time. Let's see if it actually gets through. So first of all, our four goes down to three. Then we have one point of armor here, which goes down to two. Now, if you remember, our location that we hit is going to be location six. So we get two damage to location six. So here's location six. We're going to slash off a hall box, and we've actually damaged his pivot system, which is very, very interesting. And that's it for weapons fire for us. Now, if he were returning fire, it would be pretty easy for him because um, we're like in every arc that he can possibly have, and he'd be shooting right off the left side. So um, let's go ahead and fast forward a little bit here. Let's assume that he moves like this. So that would be his end of turn marker. We'll go ahead and put him right here. Everything's gone. By the way, at the end of your phase, you'll notice that for crew actions, we can recharge shields. And uh, he does have the ability to recharge shields. He has two general shield regen, so you can actually return, generate two shields here. And by the way, the armor is not destroyed unless you have a weapon that can actually destroy it. So we're going to leave that damage in. So let's say we go to the next turn. He has no damage control parties. So if you wanted to actually fix this, he'd have to use some action points to do so. For every two action points you spend, you get basically one. Oh, no, I'm sorry. He's got a damage control party right here. If you did want to use bridge action control, as long as you have bridge points, you can always spend two of those action points in order to add as an ad hoc damage control party. So he's smart. He's going to take the damage control party, and he's going to put them here. So at the end of the turn, he's going to take a crack at trying to fix that pivot thruster that we damaged. Meanwhile, we're going to add insult to injury and take another shot. So this is the next turn. Go ahead and I'll clean this up real quick. There we go. So one, two, three, four. He's now four away in one vertical. What does that look like? Four away in one vertical is going to give us a distance of four. And remember, this is uh, basically, is it off of our nose or is it going to be off over here in the corner? This is a little bit trickier. So let's see, he's one in that direction, three in that direction, which means he's actually in our nose arc this time. He basically moved from here to here, and he's four away. So our nose arc is a nice and easy shot to take. It's going to be right there, which means we get to use our anti-fighter beams again. We can also use our missiles, but like I said, I'm saving that for a separate video. So the range now is four. Does it do anything for our anti-fighter beams? No, it doesn't do anything for our standard flak. So as usual, we're going to go ahead and spend one of our action points to take this shot. Uh, we can get rid of that little end of turn marker. We don't need it. So let's go ahead and calculate what our shot, uh, where our shot is going to be hitting. Clearly this time we're going to be hitting his right side, which means we're only going to be adding one for the profile penalty, if you want to think about it. So that means our roll at a distance of four is going to be a six up. So we need a six or better. That's an eight. It's going to be hitting location two. And it's also going to be doing, that would be three penetration capped at two. So two plus one is three damage at location two. So let's scoop back here. Let's assume he didn't regenerate a shield. So um, three damage, one gets subtracted, and it's going to be location two. So now it's going to come into here, one damage, two damage. Ah, we got his Sierra one mark um, mount, which means we've disabled one of his anti-fighter beams. You can actually come up here and mark that out like this. Maybe he should have done his damage control down there, but we're not done yet. So we're going to use our standard flak weapon now. So again, he's at range four, so it's a six up plus one for his profile, so that's a seven up. So but we get two shots, no action point cost for this one. Come on, come on, nine. I'm, I'm calling that a nine. So our penetration roll would be an eight, limited to two, plus two, which is going to be four damage at location nine. So again, it would be flying in here. So that would reduce one to three damage. Location nine is down here. So we got a bridge hit. Oh, I'm sorry, we didn't get a bridge hit. Nine, so we have two damage coming in here. We get the uniform one, it would wrap around, then we get the bridge hit. I got excited. So a bridge hit means he's got one less action point to spend. So you can see that damage is starting to accumulate pretty quickly here. Let's uh, keep denting this guy up a little bit. We'll go to the next turn. Actually, what we'll do is we'll pretend uh, we did get to the end of this turn, and now his damage control party is going to desperately try to fix that uh, pivot thruster. So to do that, it's really, really simple. You simply grab a D10. 
and you're going to roll it against the crew quality. Let's assume these guys have a crew quality of six or better. So we're going to roll this dice, and if it comes up a five or less, which it didn't, it came up a six, we'd actually have fixed the pivot thruster, which is actually pretty cool. So now that pivot thrust will be repaired, but we always mark up with a dot to remind us at the end of the uh, actual game, assuming a ship survives, it's still broken. So let's say, for example, um, he didn't get that roll, he got a two. So this would now, instead of just being damaged, it would be destroyed, and we could not try to fix it again. So that's kind of the consequence of uh, fixing with it, so to speak. All right, so we skip to the next turn. Let's assume he failed. He's going to leave his uh, damage control party. He's going to actually move his damage control party. He's only got one of them. Remember, he can always use the bridge. He's going to run down here, and he's going to try to fix the bridge, which makes sense because now he's down at one of the action points. So he's going to go ahead and move. We're going to go ahead and do what we always do. He's going to slide this way. One, two, three, one. Yep, so he's still going to be in our nose arc here. One, two, three, four away. He's still in our nose arc at four away. And we're going to go ahead and do the same thing we did last time. So remember, we're adding one to this. So let's see here. Uh, he's still at a distance of four, so it's a six up for this. Go ahead and scoop up our dice. Come on, anti-fighter beam. Hit something useful today. Seriously. So our anti-fighter beam failed. By the way, you'll probably notice it has a special ability called sweeping. Sweeping simply says that instead of just pointing our laser, we're just going to kind of chop with our laser. The advantage to sweeping is it reduces the number you need for accuracy by one, but it does one less damage. So that's not as useful at this kind of a range. It's just not a good weapon for it. So we're going to go back to our standard flak, which, in case you haven't noticed, has been out of arm. Sorry, it's a completely an arc. So I almost got distracted by this one. Never mind. So standard flak. We're going to go ahead and fire that again. So we have two shots at six or up. It's going to be a seven up. Here we go. Come on, nine. Come on, nine. That's a one. That was terrible. Go ahead and roll that again. Seven. Hey. So we're going to be doing three minus three is zero. So there's no penetration whatsoever. So that's going to be at location six, which means we're just going to do the standard damage of two at location six, which one of them is going to get eaten by the armor. If we go to location six, that's already been damaged. That's already been damaged. Hey, we got the other pivot thruster. Not bad. So that's the basic gist of using those particular weapons. Now, let's say we ran into a situation that went kind of like this. Of course, I'm slashing the opposite direction to confuse. Let's say I did an incredible amount of damage. I'm going to do 10 damage to shield regeneration. So it came in here, location three. We knocked that off. One, two, wrap around. Three, wrap around. Bam, we hit this point right here. So this means it's time to see if we've actually damaged the structural integrity of the ship. In this particular case, we have four of it. So one, two, three damage. We have seven damage left. So what we do is we roll this damage and compare it to the amount of damage that we have left. Seven. So I'm actually going to reduce this to 5 to make it a little bit easier. So if we had 7 damage left and we roll a 5, that means 5 of that damage is going to go into our structural integrity. So that would go 1, 2, 3, 4, boom. So that ship would have exploded into a giant fireball. Probably not a giant fireball. There's nothing on it that would combust. It would definitely break apart, though. All right, so that's it for beam weapons. Some of them have kind of weird abilities like slashing and stuff, but those are all described in the book. Enjoy.